And we are live. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. For those who don't know me, my name is Stella Roque and I'm thrilled to introduce a star panel for, to you, for you today for this webinar for the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum to discuss the challenges to equitable vaccine distribution from global to local perspectives. If you're joining us from Zoom today, please submit your questions on the Zoom chat, which you'll find in the menu options below. If you're watching from Facebook live stream, please post your questions in the comments below the video. With COVID-19 vaccines out, we're here to talk about the challenges to equitable vaccine distribution at the global level, and also the complexities of what happens in the global south at a national level, looking at Brazil. On the panel with us today are a stellar lineup to help us understand these issues. We have Dr. Rifat Atun, Professor of Global Health Systems at Harvard University and the faculty chair for the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program. From 2006 to 2013, Dr. Atun was a professor of international health management and head of the health management group at Imperial College London. And from 2008 to 2012, he served as a member of the executive management team of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria as director of strategy performance and evaluation cluster, where he chaired the panel that oversaw investments of around $4 billion each year in more than 100 countries. We also have here Dr. Claire Stanley, an assistant research professor at Georgetown University's Center for Global Health Science and Security, with a primary faculty appointment in Georgetown's Department of International Health. Her research focuses on the analysis of health systems, strengthening and international capacity building for public health, with an emphasis on prevention and control of infectious diseases in both humans and animals, as well as public health emergency preparedness and response. Previously, Dr. Stanley has also served as an American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the Department of State, where she supported programs for laboratory capacity building, disease surveillance, and cooperative research across the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Lower Mekong. We also have here Marcelo Leite, a former Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Marcelo is a science and environment columnist with Folha de São Paulo, a leading Brazilian daily newspaper. From 1994 to 1996, he worked as an ombudsman, a reader's advocate for the same newspaper where he also led the science opinion and international sections. Since October, 2020, he has been writing for the blog Virada Psicodélica, known uh, translation psychedelic turnaround for folia his latest book psychonautas psychonauts in press comes out may 2021 and last but not least moderating this panel is our host philip martin a former icfj and neiman fellow and a multi-award winning senior investigative reporter for the gbh news center for investigative reporting in boston welcome all of you i'm turning this over to philip to run this discussion Stella, thank you very much. And your Portuguese is very impressive. <laughs> thank <laughs> you think so much. I think Marcelo will agree. Right. Uh, hey, folks, uh, welcome. I'm glad you could join us. Um, International Center for Journalists, of course, has sponsored several forums looking at the, the um, impact of this, this pandemic, uh, which has raged across the world. And it's the global impact that we're talking about uh, today in the context of uh, this issue of, uh, of inequality in, in, in as well as inequitable distribution of the, of the vaccine. Um, you may have seen, or some of you may have seen an article that appeared uh, yesterday in the, in the Washington Post. And the headline says it all, the zero sum vaccine game, how a dose in the US takes a dose away from a poor country. That is essentially, uh, what we're talking about today, uh, those doses that are occurring globally, but also what's happening within countries, within the country of Brazil, for example, the vast nation of Brazil. And I think we'd like to, um, I'd like to first of all say uh, greetings again to our distinguished panel. Uh, I think Stella did a good job of summing up everyone's uh, background and it's quite impressive. We're gonna be very informal here. Uh, I'm gonna talk to, address people by their first names. Uh, and I'd like to start by sort of getting an overview. And I think I'd like to turn to Rafat uh, to do that. Uh, what exactly 
are we talking about in terms of vaccine distribution and how it's working or not at the, at the global level? And what is the ACT, Rafat? Uh, and importantly, what role does the private sector play in the um, partnership with these massive uh, institutional uh, global collaborations that are meant to distribute the vaccines? Yeah, great. Thank you, Philip. And it's a real pleasure and privilege to be part of this uh, wonderful panel um, with uh, my colleagues, Claire and uh, Marcelo. Um, I think it's instructive to take a step back and uh, think, you know, where were we when, when the COVID-19 pandemic struck? In relation to equity, we had huge inequalities between countries. Um, so the rich global north or Western Europe and North America, and then there's a middle group of countries and the very poor countries in Sub-Saharan Africa <clears throat> and um, in Asia. But we also had huge inequalities within countries. And what, what COVID-19 has done is, is really accentuated these inequalities and further magnified them and made them worse. And we are seeing this even in countries that have universal health coverage. For example, in the United Kingdom, that is well known for its national health system. We, we are seeing that um, black and minority ethnic groups have been the worst affected by COVID-19 and they've suffered the worst death rates. We're seeing, seeing a similar situation again in Brazil, again, which has a, a really celebrated uh, unified health system, SUS, uh, that has done so well to save so many uh, millions of lives over the years. We are seeing, again, a, a difficulty in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and huge inequalities uh, in relation to access, but also outcomes in terms of deaths, particularly again in, in, in black and minority groups and in indigenous groups. So here we are, vaccine, um, an Im a critically important tool to help us um, fight COVID-19 pandemic. And what we're seeing is that this, these structural inequalities that exist have been magnified and accentuated once again. We're seeing sort of a three tier, uh, uh, three different tiers in terms of vaccine access and distribution. The first, we have North American countries, the US and Canada and Western European countries that have been able to uh, enter into agreements to purchase these vaccines and stockpile them. I mean, some countries have purchased 10 vaccines per citizen. Then we have a group of countries in the middle that have been able to access to uh, that have been able to access some vaccines, but not enough for the whole population. Then we have countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where um, there has been any, there has been very limited vaccination. So in all this talk about equity and rights, they've all, all gone out of the window. It, it really is unacceptable in the 21st century. The response to the COVID-19 pandemic is as strong as the weakest link in the chain. As we've heard, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Of course, there are important initiatives like, as you mentioned, Philip, Act uh, Accelerator, the um, Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And as part of that COVAX, uh, the COVID-19 um, um, Global Access sort of initiative that, that WHO is leading. But in spite of these efforts, we really are not getting the vaccines to individuals who need them. And not just in poor countries, even in rich countries, we are seeing that, uh, I mean, particularly in the US uh, and a few others, we are seeing that the most vulnerable groups in terms of uh, income level uh, are not able to access these vaccines. So we're seeing this inversion of the need and what is being supplied. Um, those who need the most are really not getting access to the vaccines that could, that could be, um, uh, game changers for them in terms of saving their lives. So that needs to change uh, completely. But I'm sure Claire uh, could add much more on, on COVAX. And it would, it, it, yeah, and it, it would seem to be axiomatic that uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Uh, but that, um, however, is doesn't seem to be playing out on a global scale, Rafat. And as uh, Claire, as Rafat pointed out, uh, you also have a situation uh, where uh, uh, where you have uh, COVAX leading the charge, 
Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is caught up in this contradiction of where you have uh, even Canada, which is uh, planning on distributing over 300 million doses with a population of 38 million, uh, is also uh, subscribing to COVAX. Um, how do we how do we clear up this contradiction? How do we basically uh, establish more um, more equitable dis distribution? given the fact that this countries have already plowed ahead? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think it's it's very important to note, first of all, so COVAX is, as Rifat mentioned, is one of the three pillars of the um, ACT Accelerator. It's the, the one that focuses on vaccines. Um, and I think it's important to note that the COVAX, um, the approach to COVAX was intended to give all countries access, regardless of their ability to pay. So the idea was to create a level um, cooperative playing field where uh, COVAX facility could help navigate the landscape of vaccine production and manufacturing on behalf of participating countries um, and provide some collective purchasing and bargaining power. But it is important to note that participating countries can either self-finance, and so there's a, a route into the COVAX facility for those higher income countries that are willing to pay for the vaccine directly, um, as well as critically the opportunity to support um, access for those countries that don't have the ability to pay. And there's a separate component to COVAX called the GAVI um, Advanced Market Commitment or, or COVAX AMC, which is the element that's providing the funding assistance largely through, um, through development assistance, but also some philanthropy in the private sector to ensure that those lower and middle income countries can have access. Um, and so from the beginning, there was a mechanism for countries like Canada, which was a participating country, to access vaccination through COVAX. And that was a very important part of it, that there was going to be an insurance policy, even for countries that were exploring their own bilateral deals uh, to be able to use this mechanism as well. That being said, um, COVAX is working hard, I think, to try and address some of the inequity concerns and so in the initial distribution forecast for their first tranche of vaccines, uh, and this, this forecast came out uh, just about a week ago, there were actually four criteria that were used to determine which countries should receive doses in this in initial distribution. And uh, one of the criteria was that if a participant country had already started vaccination, it would not be included in that initial rollout. So again, trying to recognize that some countries have pursued these bilateral deals, have received vaccinations already and have started their rollout, they would not necessarily be eligible for uh, getting vaccination through, through COVAX at this stage. That said, there are countries, and, and again, I think Canada is a good example, where they have pursued many bilateral agreements but they haven't managed to secure some of those doses, so they haven't started their rollout. And so they are on that list of the initial distribution forecast for COVAX, despite having ordered so many doses. And I think that that is a, a key aspect of this inequity, that there is a distinction between um, the bilateral agreements to secure large numbers of doses versus the ability of those countries to actually receive those doses. And so countries are, are buying up many more doses than they need because of that supply and demand contradiction that we're seeing. So COVAX is trying to address it. It's, it's going some way to it, but the number of doses is just not sufficient at the moment to ensure that um, all of the participating countries, and particularly those uh, who don't have the ability to buy the vaccine themselves will receive the number of doses that they need, even just to address their highest priority populations, which is the, the key that COVAX is trying to target. Well, Claire, as a lead into Marcelo, of course, there could be fewer countries with higher priority than Brazil, which has had a uh, high incidence of um, COVID-19 infections. And But you also have a situation where you have a a president who is, is uh, as Marcelo will talk about, is a denialist. Uh, is Brazil among those uh, uh, that are part of this uh, this this schematic, if you will? And Marcelo, wondering, Marcelo, uh, on on, um, yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to, to take part in this uh, distinguished panel uh, with uh, Claire and Rifat, the real experts here. And um, special thanks to Stella for, for organizing this webinar. And uh, well, Brazil is sort of in the middle of those two extremes that uh, Rifat has mentioned. We are a, a middle income country with a 
robust health sector uh, and uh, very good uh, vaccine programs since the 1970s. Uh, and, uh, but in spite of all these favorable conditions, we are doing not so well when it comes to confronting the, the COVID uh, epidemics here in Brazil. Uh, we have now, uh, again, in our second uh, run of COVID, we have about a thousand deaths per day, which is very high for, for Brazil. And uh, altogether, 235,000 uh, deaths accumulated so far, which makes us the second place in the world, or maybe third. And uh, which is uh, important when it comes to inequity, that's the central theme uh, of our conversation here. Blacks are most mostly affected by deaths in, in Brazil, about 60% more deaths among black, uh, black people and poor people in Brazil than among uh, white people. So uh, I would say this is the price we pay for, for having elected a, a denialist and uh, president back in 2018. But I won't go too, too uh, deep into that because the central part of our discussion is not politics or ide ideology. I just want to give you an idea of what we inside Brazil are perceiving as a vaccine fiasco. Uh, we have, uh, after three weeks of vaccination, we have vaccinated only 2% of the population. And we are vaccinating about 170,000 people per day, uh, which is much less than, for instance, in 2019 with the flu vaccination campaign, when we had almost a million people each day vaccinated. So uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, a result also of the, of the uh, scarcity of, of doses that we have right now. But not only that, there are logistical problems, uh, uh, lack of coordination from the federal government and many different uh, systems applied in each state. So it's kind of complicated. Uh, we have closed agreements for the procurement of uh, vaccines uh, for uh, about 246 million doses, which is enough for only about 50 or 60 percent of the population when you consider two doses. And best case scenario would be 64 percent. And uh, we have an uncertain, uncertain supply of, of uh, uh, ingredients coming from China, also because of uh, diplomatic and political problems between the Brazilian and the Chinese government. And, uh, and when it comes to equity, uh, it's important to, to know that Brazil has established a priority list. So in the first group of uh, people who are getting vaccines in Brazil, uh, there are four categories, health workers and uh, persons ab above a certain age, age with eight years of age and then going down uh, subsequently. Uh, indigenous peoples living in, in villages uh, or uh, reserves, so to say indigenous reserves, and also persons with com comorbidities such as diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and so on. One can say there's a difference between those four categories when it comes to equity, because of course, health workers, doctors, nurses tend to be richer people in the population. But I, th I think it's justified because they, they are on the front line. So they are uh, running a, a higher risk of getting, uh, and they, they are needed to attend the, to the other people. And uh, when it comes to one, age- One question, however, Marcelo. Marcelo, just one question. Yeah. Um, and I think this is true across the, across the globe. Even though people are listed as being an, on a priority list, are they in fact being prioritized? Uh, uh, albeit the health workers, of, I don't think anyone would argue about that as a, as a priority. Are you actually seeing indigenous people, Amerindians, for example, actually being prioritized or, uh, or poorest of the poor, black people in the favelas, for example, actually being prioritized? Or is that more rhetorical than, than true? 
uh, I would say when it comes to, to black and poor people, it's more rhetoric. There, there's no real priority. Also because age tends to favor the, the richer because of differences in life and expectancy. Uh, just to give you an, an idea, the average uh, life expectancy uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Sao Paulo is about 70 years of age, but in the, in the best neighborhood could get to 80 and in the, the poorest neighborhoods could get down to 57 years of age. So this gives you an idea how much the, uh, the age criterion uh, favors the richer people, at least uh, people who are be, uh, best off in, the, um, in society. Uh, indigenous people, the, the population who live in reserves are not that big. It's about 700,000 people. And I think that's going on quite well. But you have to consider the problem is that the pace is very slow. So everybody is getting, it, it, it is going too, too slow for everybody, for all these uh, categories. And um, yeah. Uh, I think that's it for, for well. For I'm, going, start. I'm going to ask. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me ask uh, Rafat and Claire. Uh, please opine. Uh, uh, give us your um, uh, qualified views of, uh, of, if you will, indigenous people around the world. They seem to always be uh, not just in Brazil, but uh, wherever you go, uh, they seem to actually, regardless of what is written on paper, seem to be the the last priority. Are we actually seeing that? R Rufa? Yes, I, I think Marcelo provided a really great um, uh, picture of the situation in Brazil and, and that age, uh, although a useful um, metric to use for categorization is, is not uh, sufficient because it really doesn't take into account other risk factors, socioeconomic risk factors, but also ethnic background, but factors such as obesity uh, and having chronic disease. And, and one's risk of uh, dying from COVID-19 can uh, increase very substantially with the addition of um, those risk factors. And the, the stratification systems, the systems we're using to group people are not really sophisticated enough to target these groups. And, and even in the context of US, some states that have tried to do that gave up fairly quickly. And uh, they said, we really don't have the systems to, to manage this level of complexity, which is quite surprising in the 21st century with digital data systems. And you know, it's a year since COVID-19 uh, problems began. So we're really, we're really not well prepared. Now with indigenous groups, and but also I think we should focus on the minority ethnic groups, not just the indigenous populations, where we have congregate settings where these individuals are in a well-defined geographic area, yes, one can actually introduce targeted interventions, but when these groups are dispersed in different geographies among the general population, the response has been less satisfactory because we, we, we don't have the uh, systems to target high-risk individuals. And age in itself uh, is, is not a, uh, is an important but not sufficient uh, way of categorizing risk individuals. So again, this inversion um, is happening. Those who really need it are not getting the vaccines. Uh, what is the difference in that context between equity and equality, uh, briefly? Well, e e e equality is, you know, people with, uh, everyone gets the same, but each individuals are not the same. So if, it, if individuals are the same, that's fine, but individuals are very differently situated in terms of their income, their education, their risk factors, their living conditions. So equality is not enough. We need equitable access, which favors those who have the greatest need. Um, that is what I would call fair, that is justice, but we're not reaching there. Equality is, is regressive. It, it doesn't actually favor uh, the, the, those who really need the, uh, the services. Uh, thank you, Rafat. Uh, Claire, one of the things that Marcelo, of course, mentioned, he's talking about the geopolitical aspect of this, the uh, Chinese attempting to distribute um, the vaccine into, in, in Brazil, 
Uh, of course, that is uh, a lot of this is um, what China, what China and Russia are doing, and the United States and Great Britain and others or Germany, what are they're doing? This is a, another form of public diplomacy. It's a, it's another form of influencing um, the the world, but it also has a practical impact. Can you talk about the uh, the distribution, this race for uh, to distribute the vaccine? and how the geopolitics of it is also impacting uh, people's real lives on the ground or not. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and just before I answer that question, I just want to underscore what, what Riflat was saying about the inequities. And, and you know, I think that these intersectional analyses of how social determinants of health are most greatly affecting uh, the poor and, and those who need the vaccine the most is something that, that really needs to be emphasized more. And to that I'd add also um, refugee populations, I think, are at, at large risk of being overlooked by some of these vaccine distribution strategies. And, and countries like Jordan, which are offering vaccines freely to refugees are, are really leading the way in that front, but there are still challenges, of course, to accessing some of those populations too. But, but in answer to your question, Philip, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a number of things. One, one important point is that, of course, all of the vaccine candidates are different. The data are just coming out. We're just seeing the, the results being published. Um, one important thing to note also is that, for example, um, each country is approving or each country block in, in the case of the, the European Union, for example, is approving different vaccines at different rates. And so that's having a big impact on which vaccines can be distributed where. The WHO, for example, has only issued one uh, emergency um, use listing for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. They anticipate the AstraZeneca-Oxford one will come, will come shortly, but that's obviously severely limiting the availability of doses through COVAX, for example, because they cannot distribute or plan to distribute uh, vaccines that haven't been listed for this emergency use listing. So that in itself is part of the problem. And I think we are seeing a certain amount of prejudice related to how data are being interpreted across the various vaccine trials from the from different countries. And we are starting to see some geopolitical alignments occurring in terms of the countries that are accepting uh, certain vaccines or authorizing the use of certain vaccines and where some of the production, the, the producing, the manufacturing companies are choosing to, um, to advertise or to set up bilateral deals. So for example, um, you know, there are a number of countries in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that have uh, accepted the Chi several one or the two Chinese vaccine candidates, and I think again strengthening some of the perceptions of, of Sino-African alliances there regarding global health diplomacy. Um, India is another one that's uh, really put it that's put a candidate forward and is um, selling to to Afghanistan, for example. Again, as part of the uh, geopolitics of the South Asian region. So I think we're definitely seeing this play out. And, and I think that we do also need to make sure that the, the research and the trials that come into this are really solid so that we can have the, the largest view possible of where the, the risk factors are and, and the populations that will, be, that will benefit most from the various candidates. And again, I think one of the advantages of something like COVAX is that it's trying to manage that global picture. It's trying to look across all the trials and provide a comprehensive view uh, to all the participating countries um, and to help facilitate that process, which I think is another uh, benefit of the program, which is maybe sometimes overlooked. Uh, you, uh, I had understood from a Lancet article that uh, Russia's vaccine is 91% effective, uh, but uh, Ru Russia's reputation probably uh, in terms of its in terms of geopolitics right now is pretty much uh, in, the, in the toilet, if you will. Uh, and so that might be preventing some people from actually um, uh, accepting, if you will, a, a vaccine, even if it is effective. But I guess the same could be said of China and the United States, depending on uh, one's point of view is, do you find that to be a barrier? speak to that very quickly. Yes, I think that I think that is some some something of a barrier. I mean, there were concerns early on about the um, extent of the trials that had uh, been been done on the Russian vaccine, for example. So there were concerns that the trials had been rushed or perhaps even bypassed. Um, you know, great that the efficacy data now is looking very positive, but we do want to make sure that these vaccines are safe and have been ethically produced. Um, particularly given the amount of hesitancy that we're seeing around the world on the uptake of, of these vaccines and the unprecedented speed at which they've been developed. 
we know that this, the scientific rationale for these vaccines is very strong. It has been well established. So in that sense, they're not novel, but they are new candidates out there that we need to be very, very sure about before we distribute globally. So um, I think that it's, it's worth being cautious about the data coming out, but at the same time, we shouldn't let our prejudices cloud our rational judgment when it comes to the data. Uh, I, the, now, uh, Rafat, uh, Claire, Marcel, feel free to, of course, to uh, uh, address these questions um, amongst yourself. Uh, I'm the moderator, of course, but you might have questions yourselves. And But let me, um, let me also mention that we're going to uh, take uh, questions from our audience uh, in just a, a little while. One thing you brought up, Claire, and I'd like to address this to Marcelo. I'm really curious about this. Uh, refugee populations, and when you think about Syria, and when you think about the uh, numbers that are still um, coming into Europe from Africa and uh, North Africa, and when you think about the numbers coming from Venezuela, for example, into Brazil, still people are still pouring into Brazil, or the numbers are coming from the, across the Mexican border or attempting to into the United States. How do you address that? People's desperation versus the very real fear of the pandemic. Marcelo, has this been a question that's come up, uh, uh, for example, in, in Brazil and certainly in the context of where folks are coming in uh, into the country from Venezuela? Well, uh, I wouldn't say so, Philip. Uh, as far as I know, the COVID uh, epidemic doesn't uh, have in increase the number of Venezuelans that are coming to Brazil. The, the flow is not so high as it used to be one or two years ago. And uh, of course, uh, Brazil having a universal access uh, system, even Venezuelans that come to the state of Roraima are entitled to be uh, treated and uh, vaccinated. Uh, at least I assume they are. and they. Uh, they they will be uh, treated if they they come. But I would go, like to go back to the uh, geopolitical uh, situation, and it's funny because in Brazil uh, the relationship with China has played uh, a, a sort of a positive and also negative role, because we have two vaccines, two agreements with vaccines in Brazil. One with AstraZeneca from the uh, federal government and the Fiocruz uh, Institute in Rio de Janeiro, who, who is going to, to manufacture the vaccine next semester. And also uh, Coronavac from Sinovac in China. Uh, uh, there's an agreement between the uh, government and the state of Sao Paulo with uh, Sinovac to uh, uh, manufacture the vaccines here. Uh, what happened is that be, the governor of Sao Paulo being a, a political uh, uh, rival from Bolsonaro, from President Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro has attacked uh, very strongly the, the, the Chinese vaccine as he used to refer to the uh, Coronavac uh, vaccine. And uh, this uh, played a role in also uh, uh, spreading uh, doubts in the population about vaccination and the safety of vaccination was really a bad influence, uh, this mixture of pol internal politics. And besides that, uh, President Bolsonaro is also a very staunch anti-communist mm -hmm. and he attacked China with very disparaging comments on this issue and on other issues for a long time. And so Think that the delay in, in, in the um, delivery of ingredients from China, even to the state of Sao Paulo, has a lot to do also with that uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, difficult situation between uh, China and Brazil now. So this is a clear example, in my opinion, of how uh, domestic politics and also geopolitical and diplomatic uh, ties between two countries can play a role. And, make things uh, more difficult for, for, for vaccination, for instance, uh, what happened in Brazil right now. Yeah, and, and may, may I follow on that, Philip, because I think this is quite interesting. Um, unfortunately, geopolitics is getting in the way, but we're also seeing some interesting um, relationships uh, developing. And, and we're also seeing a resetting of the global health architecture in a way. Uh, um, even in the context of European Union, we're seeing Hungary actually purchasing um, 
vaccines uh, or reaching an agreement to purchase vaccines from China, from Sinopharm. Um, and, and we're seeing um, uh, Oxford um, uh, University uh, working with Russian scientists to test combination of the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine with Sputnik V vaccine. So I think some countries are being um, playing the geopolitics uh, quite strongly. Um, and some are actually being much more pragmatic. We're also seeing very interesting uh, alliances uh, developing. But I mean, the case of Brazil is um, uh, interesting in the sense that Brazil has very strong capability in vaccine production. Institute Butantan uh, is a really outstanding uh, research and production uh, entity. And they could very easily, and they are, they've actually started producing vaccines. Um, but, um, you know, the, with the strong leadership, the capacity could have been augmented far earlier. Um, so when the vaccine was, uh, the candidate was ready and approved and the trials were uh, completed, the vaccine uh, production could have been scaled up very rapidly. We've missed these opportunities because of very poor leadership in many countries, uh, unfortunately, with, with the consequence of um, uh, with consequent deaths of so many people. But coming back to Africa, which is really missing out, you know, Africa has a population of 1.3 billion people. Uh, I mean, COVAX uh, uh, has, you know, there's much to be commended in, in terms of what they're doing. But if you look at the projections and the numbers, uh, we'll have uh, sort of 90 million or so doses uh, being sort of distributed starting in February. And then by the end of 2021, about 600 uh, million doses. Uh, but we're not going to vaccinate the African population by 2024 at this current rate. This is unacceptable. Uh, you know, there's a whole continent completely missing out uh, on, on, on the vaccination. This is really delayed, slow uptake. Um, we should have thought about establishing manufacturing facilities in, in the um, in the African continent to rapidly scale up um, uh, uh, vaccine manufacturing and make it available rather than just waiting for three, four years. And this is also exacerbated, of course, by the variants of the, uh, and so uh, someone had in fact had, um, uh, let's see, uh, Maria Laura Franciosa, Franciosi, she's a journalist from Italy living um, in Brussels. She addresses this in the chat. Um, and I guess one of the questions would be for, for Claire is with the fact the fact that they have not prepared, as Rifat has pointed out, for the, the, the let's say the the manufacturers have not prepared adequately for Africa of a, a, a vast continent, what can be done in retrospect? What can be done now uh, in terms of uh, that distribution? place like Rwanda, I understand, but only about a thousand people have so far received the, uh, the vaccine. Yeah, and I think this is again where we're going to see some of that uh, vaccine diplomacy at play. You know, if you have large manufacturing capabilities in countries like India and China, um, and they're willing to provide um, a country, some of their partner countries in, in Africa with large numbers of doses, uh, particularly since China has obviously had already a very ambitious vaccine rollout domestically and India is in the in the midst of doing so as well. If they can successfully demonstrate large scale rollout in those contexts, then I think there's a, a strong likelihood that that could be mirrored in, in Africa as well. And, and you know, I, I certainly hope so. I, I hope that there's a, um, a push to to do so, since, as Rifat mentions, it's completely unacceptable, the current situation. And again, you know, I think that there we can rethink um, I hope that there's going to be greater opportunities and greater investment in something like COVAX, although again, the pace is just currently insufficient and we are reaching a point where rich countries are going to vaccinate large proportions of their population before any significant number of, of Africans are vaccinated, leading to even greater inequities in terms of global health and economies because of the way that trade is being impacted by the pandemic. And so, uh, again, I think this is a really urgent need and the more that we can collectively come together to address some of these issues, the better, but I don't see it really happening now. And, and that is exactly why India and China have this opportunity to step up and become real leaders in global health through um, providing services where, where other countries are not. One question, of course, in that, uh, again, in that context, when you talk about um, equity, of you folks, you probably may have seen this story or read about it 
uh, where a couple in British uh, Columbia <laughs> in Vancouver basically flew up in a private plane to Yukon territory among uh, uh, that's uh, in an area run by the First Nation uh, and basically pretended to be hotel workers in order to be vaccina vaccinated. Um, it's, <laughs> it's just an illustration of uh, efforts by folks to cut the line, if you will, uh, those who are wealthy. Uh, but it's also, of course, an extraordinary metaphor for what is happening on the, on the world scene. Uh, and it, but it also begs the question of Canada in terms of its, the way it's also uh, uh, distributing the vaccine. I can't get over the fact that you have over 300 million doses being ordered for a population of, um, of 38 million, while uh, so many around the world uh, uh, from, from um, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, all of Africa actually, uh, to uh, Syrian refugee camps are, are suffering. Can what can uh, be done, if you will? Uh, this is a question uh, to Claire and Rafat. What what can be um, to those countries who are practicing vaccine nationalism? That's a great question. Rich countries stockpiling vaccines at the expense of poor countries. What will be the consequences of national self interest of in uh, in their POV? Well, and this will further um, um, sort of deepen the inequities that exist, as I've said earlier. Um, you know, we, have, we have a whole continent, um, you know, African continent that is not receiving and that is not going to receive enough vaccines until 2024. That is completely unacceptable. And again, um, you know, the response to COVID-19 has to be a, a global response. We have a pandemic. We don't have isolated epidemics in one or two countries. So there needs to be global solidarity in, in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. I think you know, one year into the pandemic, one, countries should have learned that. Um, um, and, and what's important is that the, the countries that have, uh, that have reached agreements to purchase large numbers of vaccines, once they've vaccinated their populations, they should make these vaccines available and donate them, rich countries, free of charge, to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think this is uh, this will be a very important move. In fact, not doing it would be unacceptable. I think just to add to that, I know that, um, for example, in the EU, those commitments have been made, but I would argue that that's almost not good enough. You know, again, you're uh, you're, you're effectively putting your your partners on the other side of the world into a second class citizen category by saying, well, we're going to look after ourselves first, and then we'll donate the vaccine to you. And so, you know, what do we expect people in in African countries to do in the meantime? It's just completely unfair. Um, and so I, I do think that there we have to rethink the way this is happening. And I think one of the big tragedies of this is um, we knew that this was po a possibility. We knew that this could happen. And, and of course, COVAX, again, was set up to try and bolster against some of this. But back in 2009, with the H1N1 pandemic, influenza pandemic, we saw exactly the same thing. Rich countries stockpiled Tamiflu. They did advanced purchases of all the Tamiflu supplies. Many poor countries were unable to get any doses or insufficient numbers of doses. And thankfully that pandemic didn't turn out to be quite as virulent as we had feared. And so the consequences were not so grave, but that absolutely could have turned out differently. And so again, we saw it just over 10 years ago, exactly this type of thing play out and we could have been better prepared for it. And yet somehow, despite the best efforts of the WHO and, and others and, and, and many other well-meaning entities, um, we somehow have seen vaccine nationalism still come to the fore and, and dominate the discourse at this point in time. And, and I really hope that this isn't a symbol for where global health is going. And I hope that we can overcome this and, and really come together for a much more equitable view of global health moving forward. Let's, uh, let's open this up to our audience. And Marcelo, you have a- um, um, I have a question. A, a question, please. Uh, uh, it's for the three of you, Rifat, Claire, and, and Philip. Do you think that the fact that now uh, the president of the US is Joe Biden and there's a sort of uh, renewal of multilateralism will make any difference in the global scale, having the, the biggest country or the, the, the richest country uh, uh, sort of going back to, to multilateralism? Uh, interestingly, well, I, that you, I, oh, go on, Rafat, please. Well, please. no, I, I sincerely hope so, of course. Uh, and we're already seeing seeing a shift in the U.S. context. Uh, the response is becoming much more coordinated and 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 uh, more more robust and and rigorous with 
with very uh, capable individuals, um, some from my institution, uh, at the helm driving this. And, and certainly um, uh, the, uh, President Biden and his administration has, has signaled very strongly uh, their, their uh, willingness to reset the, uh, the global uh, relationships, which has been strained to, to use a conservative word um, uh, among you know, friendly nations and, and among all the nations. So certainly that should, that should help. And America with the capabilities and the financing it has can contribute a much, much to accelerate the response in countries where there's a huge need. Uh, the very question that you asked, it, I, it was swirling in my head, uh, Marcelo, after you had talked about Bolsonaro's uh, denialist policies. He was, is known as the Trump of the, of the South, uh, quite an interesting name. Uh, and uh, his approach was Trumpian <laughs> in terms of his approach to China and others. And I think with the US re-engaging with the WHO, for example, I think, um, uh, and other, uh, other international organizations, I think we will see more, more cooperation and a and more, um, if you will, unified multilateral approach to um, vaccine distribution, um, as, as Rafad said. Um, uh, Claire, any thoughts on that point uh, raised by Marcelo? No, I completely agree. I mean, I think that there is obviously a clear commitment to multilateralism within the Biden administration. They have joined COVAX, they're rejoining the WHO. These are all powerful symbols. Um, but again, unfortunately, they, you know, the US has to cope with um, a response that to date has been really um, lacking. And so there's a lot of energy being invested rightly in the domestic response and getting that under control. And I, I fear that that has weakened the US's position in terms of being an international leader in this in this uh, response effort. I think that will change as, as things progress, but um, it has it is set, set the US back in terms of taking that position. Okay, uh, folks, uh, thank you, Claire. Um, folks, if you have questions that uh, we'd like to hear from you, um, there's one here from uh, David Hathaway. Uh, Brazil used to have a private generic in Me Too pharmaceutical industry that could license or even get compulsory licenses to meet the nation's needs at affordable prices. India still does. What happened? Um, anyone want to take that on? Marcelo, on anyone? Yeah. Well, uh, I would say uh, that Brazil sort of backpedaled uh, in these issues uh, because of a change in the political um, panorama in the country. Uh, one could say that the, the politics in Brazil became more conservative in the last five or six years uh, after the Workers' Party government. But uh, David Hathaway, whom I know, <laughs> uh, uh, is right. Uh, we sort of backpedaled in this uh, issue and uh, there's there has been not so much investment in 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 um, in the pharmaceutical industry in Brazil. There are no government uh, federal uh, policies uh, directed to that, as was the case in the past. And uh, and in general, not so much investment in science and technology. So that's what happened, I think. And if I can just add very quickly to that, you know, I think because this is all about equity, um, there's obviously been a big push also for um, publication of the licensing for the COVID-19 vaccines, right? And so there's been um, conversations ongoing about how particularly those vaccine candidates where public money was used, should those licenses actually belong to the public and, and the private sector not be allowed to profit from them in the way that they are. Um, this is a global good. Um, it's critically important to restoring the global economy. And so I think there was a question in the chat actually related to that about, you know, um, some of the pharmaceutical companies raising their prices and, and only and preferentially giving treatment to those countries that are willing to pay above asking price or the highest prices. And I think these issues are all linked together. You know, is this an opportunity to rethink how um, the public good is recognized when it comes to things like mass uh, vaccination or countermeasures for pandemic threats? And to what extent do we allow private industry to profit from this kind of crisis versus uh, acknowledging the absolute need to allow even those people in those countries that can't afford to purchase them directly to have access to these vaccines? So there's some very big questions here that go far beyond even just global health, but are, are deeply embedded in the concept of equity and, and I think need to be considered before we face the next pandemic, which, as we all know, is there will always be another health threat coming down on the horizon. So we need to be prepared better next time. 
Rafan? No, absolutely. Uh, I think Claire has summarized it very, very nicely. And, and, and it's very important that capabilities uh, are developed um, for, um, for doing the trials, but also uh, for, for manufacturing. And, and we, should, we should think how, also how creatively we can use sort of public private sector partnerships uh, because you know, private sector can bring agility and, and expertise, for example, in supply chain management, in, in developing manufacturing facilities, so how we can harness all the capabilities because this is affecting everyone um, and ensure that this is an opportunity for the private sector to, to show their uh, capabilities, but also uh, contribute to, to broader and, and greater social good. Um, and also I think the international uh, development uh, uh, agencies and banks World Bank and the regional development banks could also play an important role uh, in, in um, funding the necessary infrastructure in, in Latin America as well as in, in, the, in the African continent to develop these capabilities. So let's not miss these opportunities and, um, and not, not wait for the next pandemic. We should be acting now because we're not going to get vaccinated uh, in many countries until 2024. Wow. I, I'm breathless when, when you hear that, when we talk about, uh, just think about the possibility of how long this pandemic could, could go on. Uh, there are two questions here, and I'm thinking about our time. We have about six minutes left, uh, and I'm going to ask these and see if we can, see if you can address these uh, within that time limit. How do we, this is from um, Chidera Rose Camille, how do we ensure vaccine equity? Africa seems to be left behind. Uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine sent to South Africa at expiration date as April, which is enough time to distribute. Um, it, and I'll ask the second question too. So <clears throat> we have both of these queued up. On donating extra doses, this is from Sue Ann, Sue Ann Lim, on donating extra doses of vaccines, is this a viable solution to the current inequities and in access to vaccine, what are the possible repercussions on the existing health inequities between countries? Please, uh, however you'd like to take the, those two questions on, panel. I can briefly, I, these are really excellent questions. Uh, so I think there's some short term actions that can be taken uh, in order to address the, the inequities that exist and the huge delays that, um, uh, many poor countries, including the African continent, is and will be experiencing. So it, it is important that um, you know there's no stockpiling and these vaccines are made available. But that doesn't solve the problem for the for the next pandemic or 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 the future. So we also need to invest in capabilities and infrastructure to ensure that there, there are cap uh, th there are manufacturing facilities to to be able to scale up rapidly enough. In, in the African continent and also in, um, uh, in countries of Latin America and, and uh, Asia with, supply, with appropriate supply chains to ensure that the vaccines that are produced are actually available and reach the individuals who need them because vaccine does, is not equal to vaccination. And we have many weak health systems that need to be strengthened. Good point. Uh, not equal to vaccination. That's right. Even in terms of delivery systems, that's a huge problem. Claire? Yes. I was just going to say exactly that point, which is that I think we're learning a huge amount about what kinds of vaccination strategies work in different contexts. We're establishing these incredible new platforms for manufacturing. And as Rifat says, I think this is a, an opportunity then to create these longer term systems, provided we put the governance approaches in place to make sure that we do better next time that we plan appropriately. Um, but I actually would love to hear from Marcelo about the, the second part of that last question in terms of possible repercussions. What do you think is gonna be the impact to Brazil, for example, on, on the problems that you've seen so far with vaccines? Well, <laughs> a difficult question. Uh, I would say in general that the um, image of science and technology is, is getting better in Brazil, the need to invest in that, although not from the federal government, uh, which is now in place in Brazil, uh, you don't see much of this movement in the, the right direction, but I would say in the general population and then the public opinion, 
is clear now that we do need investment in those kind of facilities, for instance, as Rifat has mentioned, uh, Fiocruz and uh, Instituto Butantan in Sao Paulo, Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro, Instituto Butantan in Sao Paulo, uh, do have capacity to, to manufacture vaccines. And uh, there has been some investment, also private investment in Instituto Butantan, which is a good sign that society is uh, really uh, taking note of that. And, uh, but uh, it's too little, too late, I would say, when it comes to the pandemic. Uh, we still don't have uh, the, the, the capability of manufacturing all the vaccines we need. And we depend on China and India to provide the ingredients because uh, the active uh, uh, pharmaceutical ingredient is not yet produced in Brazil, uh, manufactured in Brazil. We do need those batches coming from China, especially from China, both AstraZeneca and CoronaVac, uh, the ingredients are coming from China. And then there's all this diplomatic uh, problems between China, and, which some people think are delay, are behind the delay of, uh, in, in, in uh, delivery of those uh, ingredients to, to Brazil. But, in general, I would say that uh, maybe the future government of Brazil, the next one would uh, put more investment and uh, priority in, in science, technology, and this kind of investments. I hope so. I think we all do. I, <laughs> I think we also have to hope that the imperatives of, um, of uh, capital and, and uh, selfish uh, nationalism uh, also don't override the need for global a global response to uh, to this issue. What, I'd like, uh, if you will, the three of you to sum up very quickly um, uh, within the next two minutes, <laughs> three minutes, uh, two minutes, I think we have, uh, uh, starting with uh, Rafat and Claire and then Marcelo, what has to happen next in order for um, uh, this equity to actually take hold, uh, for, uh, for, for the rent to actually be equity? Yes, um, important question. First of all, we need to take uh, the issue of inequalities very seriously. This shouldn't be just talk. We, we need action. We need to put systems in place that recognize uh, not just uh, uh, recognize the magnitude of the inequalities that exist, but the nature of inequalities and, and the underlying reasons. And then put systems in place to address them, because unless we address these sort of so-called upstream sort of determinants that lead to inequalities, um, again, we'll, we'll come to the next health threat with these inequalities in, in place. Secondly, we need to have systems in place. And when we're, uh, we need to be prepared and we, we, need, we need to be able to respond to recognize uh, which vulnerable groups need to be, um, need, need, need to be um, appropriately supported in the epidemic. It's not just about vaccine. I mean, if you think about employment, unemployment, uh, you know, you know the poor, the poorest segments, or those with lowest income and in informal uh, jobs, have had the uh, have had really terrible outcomes in terms of uh, losing their jobs, not being able to uh, hold hold on to their employment, and and um, and and also adverse effects on on their health. So we need to, you know, take stock and rather than talking, put systems in place to to prepare and importantly to act when it matters. Claire? Yeah, I would just add to some of what we've said before and, and make two points. So one is I think we need to continue to strengthen multilateral institutions that relate to global health governance. There's been a lot of talk about reform and, and, um, and bolstering the WHO, and that needs to absolutely happen in a very clear-sighted way. Um, and then I really liked both Rufat and Marcelo mentioning the idea of um, strengthening domestic science and technology and manufacturing capabilities. I think we need to rethink global supply chains um, and, and, you know, create those opportunities for greater strengthening within um, across the world and not just in, in high and middle income countries. So that's something I think that could be really positive, both in terms of the broader economic gains, but also um, in terms of strengthening health security more, more generally. Marcelo. I think that the, uh, the, the takeaway message for me is something that Rifat said in the beginning, that no one is safe until everybody's safe. And uh, in, in order to, to go in the right direction, I would say that for starters, we, sh we should 
put pressure on, on the government rich countries, governments that are stockpiling vaccines that they should donate the surplus doses they have to poor countries or maybe uh, through a uh, COVAX initiative. And uh, the second point is what Claire just said, that we have to strengthen the uh, production uh, capabilities in, in, in middle income countries to say the least in order to, to provide, to be able to, to become more independent from, from uh, uh, rich countries and industrialized countries. Uh, I think that's the, the way to go. Uh, look, thank you, all of you. Um, I am truly honored. I really mean that from the bottom of my heart to have uh, taken part in this panel discussion with you, this International Center for Journalism uh, panel. And I'm going to, at this point, turn this over to Stella to, uh, to lead us out. Um, uh, Stella. Thank you to everyone for this excellent discussion. I have to say it was it was a really in-depth webinar on this topic and it was absolutely necessary for us to have this conversation. And I hope all our forum members really did benefit from it. Um, if you're not a member of the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum yet, and you're attending this event via Zoom, I encourage you to please find the group on Facebook, or for more information on the forum, please go to www.icfj.org. Please don't forget to fill out the survey coming to your inbox after this webinar. ICFJ would love your feedback to improve our programming for this series. And importantly, we will have a recording of this webinar available on the ICFJ and IJNet YouTube channels. So you will have this as a continuing resource to go back to and refer to. Thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And thank you to Philip for moderating again and Claire for having you back. Marcelo, Rifat, thank you very much. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank, thank you, you, Stella. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Thank Bye. you and thank see you, you next Stella. time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.